Hello everybody, welcome to Leet Wine TV. I'm Hello everybody, welcome to Leet Wine Hello everybody, welcome to Leet Wine TV. I'm your host, Mark Fusco, here for another edition of show. So we've got the Thanksgiving episode going on. Uh, didn't I don't have the green screen going on because, well, it's kind of late at night and just trying to get some, uh, some reviews done. Um, before we get started, uh, do a little life update, a little, little update what's going on. I didn't really do it during the Halloween episode because, well, I just don't ever really do it. Um, <clears throat> so I have a new job. Um, so back in September, September, uh, mid-September, um, I left the job I had before, which was I was the assistant manager and sommelier at Morton's The Steakhouse. Um, so uh, as per usual, uh, and, and I'm sorry. And then um, I uh, took on a position of food and beverage director um, at another establishment here in San Antonio. Uh, as per usual, I do not mention the actual name of where I currently work. However, I have no problem saying where I used to work. Um, so, um, I had an incredible seven years with the Landry's Corporation, um, <clears throat> with, uh, uh, Saltgrass and Morton's and Steakhouse and, uh, for all my, uh, colleagues at Morton's, especially, um, both here and other cities in the, in the, in the United States, uh, I just want to thank you all for, um, some incredible times and, uh, learning a lot and, and, uh, the support I had from not just the store level, but from the corporate level. Um, but it was time to move on to a new place. Um, I'm really excited at where I'm going to be at, where, not where I'm not going to, where I are currently am at. <clears throat> and, um, and, and just having a new role and, and really having kind of a, a free reign to, uh, to, um, work with a beverage program that I don't have to, uh, uh, I don't have a corporate list. Um, so there's advantages and disadvantages to that. The advantages are I can pretty much do what I want and be pretty nimble with it. Um, disadvantages, I don't have a billion dollar company behind me uh, to, for emergency power, but, um, I've been in the industry long enough. I made a plenty, I've made plenty of contacts, so I'm, I'm pretty confident that, um, uh, that I can uh, do really well with it, and I'm really excited uh, to be in a new uh, role. Um, operation went well. Um, basically, I'm, uh, uh, recovery is done. Uh, recovery ended officially ended at the end of September, so um, that's all good to go. And uh, I did my um, so today is the eighth. Well, that's because after midnight, it's the 8th of November and, um, uh, this is, this is Thursday. So back on Monday, I took my, um, knowledge survey for the advanced sommelier exam. Um, I feel like I did pretty well with it. I didn't complete the test. Um, I probably really should have gotten about four or five more questions completed, but I took a little extra time on some questions because I wasn't quite sure, but I felt I did really well overall on, on the little knowledge survey. So hopefully it'll be good enough along with uh, the recommendations that I've asked for um, to, uh, to do well with that. And um, let's see, with that said, let's get into some Thanksgiving wine. So um, all the wines I purchased for today and also the wines I, I'm going, I, I purchased for the Christmas episode, I got all of them at High Street Wine Company. So, uh, during the course of our, our tastings, of course, uh, we have a Monday morning tasting and pretty much we almost always meet at High Street for our Monday morning uh, Psalm uh, blind tastings. And they were advertising in a holiday pack. Now they had a three pack and a six pack. And I was like, well, the six pack, I'm looking at the wines. I'm like, these, you know, like can use somewhat interchangeably with Thanksgiving and Christmas. So I went ahead and just bought the six pack because uh, I'm like, got my holiday wines already bought. Now, at the same time, 
in in the in the cellar here um, after I've gotten the last set of deliveries, in, including these wines, um, I still have two more Psalm Select deliveries to show up. But I've got 130 bottles in there, and they are almost literally almost exactly 50/50 New World, Old World, and a wide variety of stuff. Now, off the top of my head, I don't have any Riesling other than the first wine we're going to try. So. As far as traditional Thanksgiving wines, we went with Riesling, Chardonnay, Pinot Noir. I mean, it's pretty, pretty basic stuff. Not basic, but, you know, pretty standard stuff. So I didn't really have any Riesling uh, in the cellar, and I don't have any Riesling that I know of coming from Psalm Select. So it was good to have that, have that thing. But I could have, I could have definitely have cobbled together some, some, uh, uh, some wines for Thanksgiving, some traditional wines for Thanksgiving. So, all right. So with that said, let's get into the wines. Um, yes. Take a little new water bottle. All right. I really like this one too. Oh yeah. What is this? So this is the 2016 Tatamer uh, Steinhugel Riesling from California. Uh, no, no, uh, it's just California. So, <clears throat> Who, who, who are these guys? I guess I have my stuff in the wrong way. So um, there's a gentleman, <clears throat> the website, you know, this guy's like, I did this and blah, 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 blah. But we, we don't know his first name. However, I can tell you his first name because I found under Robertson Wine, uh, their, their website, this is a, this is a wine shop out of England. Uh, his first name is Graham. So Graham say, hi, I'm Graham Tatimer. Anyway, uh, so Graham, uh, he started in the industry and hold on, let's get back. Blah, blah, blah. Uh, he said he began working in the wine business, uh, at the age of 16 for Santa Barbara winery. Um, and it was just like a job. And through that, job he found out he had a passion for wine um and uh he over time he made a bunch of different wines and different grapes but he ended up going to austria in 2003 and he had anticipated only being there for like 10 weeks but it ended up being i think he said like a year or two uh in austria and he worked for uh weingut noll um and through that he learned uh uh, to really kind of fall in love with Riesling and Gruner Veltliner. So, um, and then in 2008, he moved back to the States and, um, or before then he moved back to the States. In 2008, he founded, uh, uh, Tatimer, I'm assuming that's pronouncing it correctly, with two Riesling vineyards. Uh, his intention was, uh, to use his knowledge to make bone dry Riesling in California, unlike many of the off dry examples in the marketplace at the time, or he says today. Um, and he started off with a 400, 400 cases in a small corner of a good friend's boutique winery. Uh, since then he's added one more Riesling vineyard as well as two Gruner, uh, for a total production of 1100 cases. And he's, uh, planning to explore the depth of his current sites and pursue new central coast terroir in the years to come. Um, so there's, they're out of, he's out of Santa Barbara and, um, this exact wine, oh, by the way, uh, so like I said, the, the, the six pack was 125. So, um, this at high street retails for $30. Uh, your prices may vary depending on where you are in the world or in the country. Uh, but this particular wine is not on the website. He's got other wines listed, but not this one. Um, and I found this, like I said, I found this of all places on a British, um, well, actually a couple well, no, this one's this one's the United States. So, uh, Triangle Wine Company—they're out of the U.S. Uh, they have their um, retail price at twenty-one ninety-nine, and then, um, like I said, the um, uh, Robertson Wine—they uh, have theirs at twenty-three pounds uh, per bottle, and so that's probably close to thirty bucks. So, thirty bucks. Anyway. Let's check it out. All right. Did a little click, but 
I went to Morton's for dinner today and I got a wine and used the Corvin on it and I heard a little click and that usually means like it's about to run out. But this one, I just put a brand new thing in recently, so it should be good. Alrighty. I always like doing the white wines because you get to see, you get to see like the gas get injected. It's just kind of cool. The red wines, it's kind of hard to see all the bubbles go in there, but the white wines, it's pretty cool. Man, it's fairly aromatic. I, I mean, I feel like I just walked into a winery. Um, so let's check it out. So, um, it's, it's all cloudy from the, from the, um, from the gases. Definitely, uh, I would say medium plus aromatic to high. So high. So uh, on the aromas now, these these wines are, are are not like ice cold. I mean, I the cellar, the white wine side of the cellar is set thing for forty five, and the red wine side is set for like fifty five. Um, I think it's actually set for like forty eight, but it gets down to forty five frequently. So they're not ice cold, but this, this white wine is probably right around serving temperature at this point. So I'm kind of struggling with the, um, with the aromatics, like this for a, a descriptor. I mean, I smell it as wine, but I guess it's, it's like a, an apricot, apricot aroma. And like I said, this is probably because it might be a little too cold to really get the aromatics. Um, yesterday, <clears throat> yeah, yesterday I went to um, High Street, no. Yeah, because yesterday really was Tuesday in my in my world, not Wednesday. Um, so I went over there after work <clears throat> to, um, uh, well, I needed to get the pricing for the wines, but um, they handed me uh, uh, what ended up being a, um, an Austrian Riesling, um, and, uh, Aromatically, there wasn't a whole lot going on, but once I once I took a sip, it was like a whole new world. So I uh, yeah, it's like apricot, um, some lime, lemon. There's an herbal quality to it, a, little, a slight herbaceousness to it. Um, there's also this. Um, I was like a candied, a candied fruit. So, um, fun fact, I've never had a Meyer lemon and that came, that was a top of a discussion at high street yesterday. And no, well, well, I think it was Monday. I think we're, no, it was, it was Tuesday night. We're talking Meyer lemon and I said, never had one, but you know, that's one of those descriptors that everyone loves to use. And it got kind of described to me. And, um, then I had, <clears throat> then I had the Riesling. And I was like, I think I get Meyer lemon out of this because it has this lemon orange uh, candied quality to it. So it's, it, this is kind of like that. Yeah. It's kind of like that. Other than that, there's not a whole lot going on in the nose. Very tasty. Um, a good collection of fruit. It's, it's really got an orange lemon, so Meyer lemon uh, quality to it. Um, the apricots there, there's a little bit of candy, candification there, um, but this is definitely a dry wine. This is not a sweet wine at all. Um, I definitely would call it bone dry. Um, so it, and peach, you got peach, orange, lemon, apricot, um, th those are the predominant fruit flavors to it. Um, acidity is definitely high. So mouth is really watering. Um, it's pretty, pretty, pretty high acid. My nose just itches. Ugh. anyway, um, got that alcohol is not over the top. I think it's 13% alcohol actually. 
Yeah, 13% alcohol. So it's not 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 a high alcohol wine, you know, very medium alcohol. Uh, it's very balanced. Um, nothing really dominates anything. Uh, no evidence of wood, which we would, I mean, as far as new wood, which we would tend to hope. But as far as like its vinification or, or, or it's, you know, how it's stored, um, it's possible it maybe it may got stored in old wood, um, but I don't have anything, I mean, I don't, I don't feel like it's oxidized any, by any means. Like if you told me it was stainless steel, like it sat in, it sat in stainless steel tank for X number of months to like settle um, and never saw wood, I would be okay. And it's something opening up a little bit more. There's like a, a creamsicle quality to it so maybe it has seen oak um some more um some more spices to it on the palate i really don't get the creamsicle quality to it so it may not have seen oak it's just like that aroma but it might have seen oak also, just a little bit. Um, it's very tasty. I, I like the wine. Um, I don't drink enough Rieslings. Um, I'm not. I'm not like head over heels in love with Riesling. Um, I don't. I don't hate it though. So um, uh, yeah, I mean it's a good wine. All right, so let's so let's move on to wine number two. All right, wine number two. All right, this is the um, 2016, and I'm gonna really butcher this name, uh, unfortunately. Um, where we go? Vaz Felix, or Vase Felix uh, Chardonnay. Uh, it's a Phileas Chardonnay, 2016, from Margaret River. So we're talking uh, southwestern Australia, and um, I could use Corvin cap on this. Anyway, uh, it this retails this retails at High Street for twenty four dollars. I didn't, you know, when I, in my research for it, there's a regular website. I went to that. Um, I didn't see any. Um, uh, I didn't. I didn't like look anywhere for pricing. So I'm just gonna figure twenty four dollars is probably a pretty reasonable uh, uh, retail amount. So let's let's talk about this winery, and uh, it was founded in uh, 1967. Great year. Uh, by Dr. Uh, Tom Culity or Culity. Um, they say the pristine isolation, ancient lands, and twin oceans make Margaret River a wine paradise and one of the world's greatest environments to grow ultra premium Cab and Cabernet Sauvignon and Chardonnay. Um, they also have Shiraz, Semillon, Sauvignon Blanc blends, and, uh, and those are the primary focus of the winery. Uh, all wines are estate grown in their, in their four uh, vineyards, then estate made and bottled within the state of the art winemaking facility. Um, let's see here, what else we want to talk about here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, hey, fun fact the region contributes just 3% to Australia's total wine production, but commands over 20% of the premium market with wines that are blah, blah, blah. Okay. <clears throat> um, so. Dr. Tom Tolliti founded it, and then, um, let's see here. Who's the gentleman that currently owns it? Let me get all the bottom. So, uh, Paul Holmes Accord, that's yeah. how his name is said, uh, represents the second generation of the family who have owned and operated uh, Vaz Felix since 67. He took over the estate in 2005 and became the sole owner um, uh, in 2008 of the parent company. And, um, so the name, so Vas or Vase or Vase, uh, natural least and ge geograph were the maiden ships in the Baden expedition undertaken by the French to map the coast of Australia, uh, from 1800 to 1803. And, uh, they were the first to discover the Southwest coast of Australia arriving from Mauritius in the peak of winter to storms of eight foot swells. Uh, so unfortunately, uh, on the 8th of June, 1801, 
the naturalists assistant helmsman uh, got thrown overboard from 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 the from the waves. Uh, this was the disappearance of Thomas Timothy Vaz or Vaze. Maybe not Vaze. There's no there's no accent or grave uh, on, on over the e. But so Vaz, uh, while he was originally thought to have drowned, tons of rumors sprung up about. Did he survive? And if he did, who picked him up? And where did he go? And he ended up in England or got imprisoned or whatever. So anyway, so he, it was a colorful history for this gentleman who got lost at sea. Um, Felix, uh, so Dr. Tom Cullity was an avid historian, and he hoped that his vineyard would enjoy a happier fate um, than Vaz. So he named it Vaz Felix, meaning lucky or happy Vaz. Um, they have a peregrine falcon on their label. Um, right there, peregrine falcon. Um, in 71, when they only had four years of vineyards, um, to protect the grapes from bird damage, a, uh, during harvest, falconry was attempted and um, didn't go out, didn't go so well. The, the, Basically, day one, they released a falcon, and it, like, flew away. All righty. Now, um, as far as this particular wine, let's see here. I got my Corvin caps. I don't know which one it's going to be. Probably this one. So, let's see here. Um, soil composition, they say, is deep gravel uh, loam soil over clay. All right, it's the right size. Um, <clears throat> the vineyard was planted in 1998, and the average vine age is 20 years. Um, they harvested from late February to early March, uh, 2017. And, uh, the first vintage of the wine was 2013. Uh, they do whole berries, airbag press following five hours of skin contact for, for, for the pre-fermentation. Uh, then it is fermented in barriques. So smaller barrels. Um, they say their fining agent is vegan. Um, the age of their containers. So they have 15% uh, of the barrels are new and 85% are one to five year old uh, French barrels. And the length of aging before bottling is eight months. And then the length of bottle aging is six months. Let's see what else. Uh, alcohol is 12.5%. They said the residual sugar is 0.7 grams per liter. Um, acidity is 6.3. Uh, pH 3.3. Those are all the really super geeky numbers if you want to get into that. Um, and yada, yada, yada. All right. Let's see if there's anything else on this other fact sheet that I want to talk about. Nope. Okay. Again, it's hazy, cloudy because of the Corvin. I don't think I would mis mistake this for anything other than Chardonnay. There's definitely a, a buttered popcorn uh, quality to it. Yeah. A bit of green apple, uh, yellow apple. Again, the, the wine is probably a little a light, slightly too cold. Because I'm, I'm really just getting the, the popcorn and the green apple, yellow apple um, aromas. Um, a bit of vanilla, a bit of um, uh, creaminess, a bit of, um, uh, what is it? Um, yeah, just a bit of vanilla. Well, let's taste it. I figured I'd wear the shirt this time. Tasty. I really like this one, actually. Um... And I mean, I'm somewhat of a member of the ABC club. That's anything but Chardonnay club, but really tasty. And you know, it's got the new oak, but it's, it's not a whole lot. 
um, it's only 15% new, so you get a touch, a touch of that vanilla and creaminess to it. Um, it it's, it's really more of a fruit forward wine. Uh, predominantly orange, lemon. Um, those are the two main flavors you get out of it. Um, it's very tasty. Acid's pretty high. Um, I mean, it's 6.3 grams total acidity. pH is, this is 3.25. Um, so the lower the number, the higher the acid. So, I mean, it's not like 3.0 or 2.9. Um, pH uh, is a logarithmic scale, if I remember correctly. So if I went from a 3.25 to a 3.2, it's a pretty big jump. It's tasty. I mean, it's totally, totally a good Thanksgiving wine. Um, I mean, I can see pound, pounding this before the dinner starts, you know? Really easy drinking. A touch of grassiness to it. Really nice. All right. How are we doing? Not terrible. I'm using, I'm using the big dog because I found I found the cable that plugs into it, so I can use my my backup battery, my uh, my you know, my big my big old battery to power it. I love the fact you can do that. Uh, it's a little overkill at the house, but I also don't have to come up with four AA batteries. So very nice, very nice wine. Oh yeah, and by the way, I said I couldn't find that cable. It was exactly where it was with with the, the the microphone i came down i came down and looked at it a few days ago i was like really and i just ordered more of the usb cable to plug in so i'm sorry all right so let's let's move on so let's move on to wine number three all right so this is the 2017 domain Le Bruel. And it's L-E, well, just lower third on there. Um, Bourgogne, Pinot Noir. And um, so from France, from Burgundy. It's just an entry-level Pinot Noir from Burgundy, from this, from this uh, winery. Now, on this wine, the actual wine does not exist on the website. So yet again, the wine doesn't, doesn't exist on someone's website. Um, they do have a Savonet Le Bon. Um, uh, wine that is kind of an entry level. Then they have some some higher level ones, but yeah, for some reason it's on the website. Anyway, this wine retails at High Street for thirty dollars, and I did not I do not have any other retail pricing from anywhere else. So your retail pricing may vary. Whoops, there we go. All right, so uh, this winery, uh, the Le Bruel family estate uh, in Savonet Le Bon, dates back to 1935, when present winemaker Jean Baptiste, uh, his grandparents purchased two hectares of vines. Um, Pierre, who is Jean Baptiste's father, so the middle person, uh, enlarged the estate to seven hectares and acquired a bottling line, uh, acquired a bottling line. Um, after stages in Bordeaux and abroad and a degree from the Lycée Viticole in Beaune, Jean-Baptiste joined his father in 1999. Uh, the, 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 the domain became officially known as Pierre and J.B. Le Bruel in 2001, and then it was enlarged again to its present size of 9.5 hectares. Um, yes. <clears throat> so Jean-Baptiste, he, he basically, you know, been around. Uh, working in a bunch of places, working in the vineyards and all that to really, you know, learn his craft. And, um, yeah, that's all I got to say about that. All right. So the wine, Pinot Noir. So let's check it out. Oops. Give me a minute. So, 
right off the bat, most likely I would think this on the nose to be a New World Pinot, a Cali Pinot specifically. Really bright red cherry, like almost maraschino cherry. You got, you got the spices from the, from oak, um, Christmas spices. I had a cardamom at work the other day. Never had one before. Like I actually ate the little seed. Not quite that aroma, but I kind of get it now. A touch of blackberry, a touch of black raspberry. Some coffee. Um, not quite a tiramisu quality, but like an espresso, maybe cappuccino, coffee um, aroma. And a bit of bramble to it. Let's, let's go ahead and taste it. So it definitely leads with earthiness. That's good, at least for my palate. Um, very bramble, really, just you now that like out, you know, brush. Very much like that. I can pick, be, I can picture being like in a building with really old wood. It's untreated, you know, paint's peeling off of it. That that kind of feeling, almost like when you walk into like one of those quaint little artsy fartsy shops in a small town. Um, similar, like on that on the palate, it's really opening up the the nose. Um, got got the bright cherries still, but loads of spices going on here. Christmas spices, allspice. Um, but I also get like a touch of like oregano. Some thyme, some rosemary. I'm digging that. I'm digging that because I, I tend to like old world style a bit better. Um, fruit isn't like super ripe, but it's like kind of slightly underripe. It's a little, little tart, so that's good. I mean, it's a, definitely an entry level burgundy. Um, it's not, it's not terribly expensive. I mean, at 30 bucks, it's still, still premium, uh, premium pour, but you know, from a, from a high quality producer, it's nice. Touch of mint to it too. All right. So that's going to do it for this episode. As always, click the links above to friend me up. Uh, click any links below to learn more about the wineries. Um, this winery, the actual winery page is in French. Just saying. So stumble through that and now use Google Translate to like fill in the blanks. Um, hit, click the donate button if you, if you so choose. You don't have to. Um, and we'll see everyone again next time.